My wife has uh, Lewy body's disease. Before she was diagnosed with it, I'd never heard of it before. And I've come to find out that there are an awful lot of people who haven't, even though there's something like 1.3 or 1.4 million people in this country who do have Lewy body's disease. In fact, a lot of healthcare professionals and primary care providers aren't real familiar with it either. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephen Gompertz. And I really hope that this is interactive. I'm not used to using microphones, so if I get a little soft, let me know. Uh, but the intent here is for this to be very much an interactive opportunity for you to learn about a disease that's just uh, poorly advertised to, to the state, and we really want to fix that. It's for that purpose, over the last year, I set up the Lewy Body Disease Unit, the Lewy Body Dementia Unit at Mass General Hospital, and I'm very excited about that. I've been caring for patients with dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson's dementia for well over 10 years now. Um, this is there's obviously really a need as, as the audience can attest to today. I'll tell us, um, broadly speaking, about thinking, um, about how it can fail in multiple different ways. I'll talk to us about Alzheimer's disease and how it looks, and then distinguish it uh, from dementia with Lewy bodies and its sister disease, uh, the dementia that arises in Parkinson's disease. So thinking can actually be divided usefully um, by clinicians into lots of different domains of, of, uh, of thinking. So thinking involves your ability to pay attention, for example, to this presentation now, to keep it in mind and to hold it in mind as you listen to the words I provide. Um, without attention, you can't do anything else. Uh, but you can still have attention in place and have trouble in other domains as well. There's memory, of course, your ability to retain memory for this visit, for this meeting afterwards, for example, recent short-term memory. And of course, there's long-term memory as well, where we went to school, uh, the name of our wife, uh, our spouses, for example. Uh, it turns out that that particular domain, memory, involves memory systems of the brain that localize completely differently from these other domains of thinking. That's one of the reasons it's so useful to, to parse thinking into these different domains. Language is an, another important domain. There's an understanding what I'm telling you, language comprehension. There's language fluency, our, my ability to talk to you, uh, get my thoughts across, coming up with the right uh, word of objects uh, and words in general, naming. Again, a completely different uh, circuit in the brain is involved in, in, uh, in subserving language. Visual spatial skill, uh, my ability to navigate here, uh, without relying on GPS, depends strongly on, on that skill. Our ability to get around uh, in our environment, find the bathroom in the middle of the night uh, as well, uh, to a completely different location in the brain, um, and can so be selectively impaired with, with preservation of language and memory, for example. Uh, response speed, uh, independent of these as well. Procedural memory refers to our ability to do uh, tasks that are related like riding a bicycle, for example. Uh, this, this kind of memory is very different from our ability to remember a conversation, um, and it can, go, it can be preserved in the face of difficulty remembering conversations and, and vice versa. Uh, tool use, our ability to uh, understand how to manipulate a knife and fork to do what we want them to do, again, subserved by, by different neural circuits. And then there's this whole term called executive function, um, which sounds a little bit like gobbledygook, but it refers broadly to a bunch of skills that require uh, frontal striatal circuitry, uh, planning, multitasking, judgment, being able to listen in real time to our conversation, hold on to the information that you're hearing, manipulate it, um, craft your own questions, that requires executive function. And that can also be selectively uh, impaired. So, it, and of course, I've only touched upon some of the aspects of uh, of, of thinking, but it's relevant because different diseases can impact these different domains differently um, and distinctly, and so doctors can use that to help us figure out what the disease is and what to do about it. So what is dementia? Dementia refers very specifically to a condition in which people have developed sufficient trouble with their thinking over time that they're no longer independent. And uh, 
again, this can happen in more than one domain. It can happen with respect to memory, uh, shorter long-term memory, with respect to language and tool use, with respect to abstract thinking, judgment, these executive functions we've talked about, personality changes. But these need to be impaired. They need to significantly interfere with our activities of daily living, such as our ability to work or socially engage, uh, have relationships with others. Um, and there needs, of course, not to be another explanation, uh, like a new medication that the doctor just prescribed that may be really confused. That's not dementia. That, that's a medication or a urinary tract infection and so forth. But if you take away all that other stuff, um, you're left with, with a dementia. And there are many different causes of dementia. And some of them, uh, many of them are neurodegenerative, meaning they are relentlessly progressive diseases, like dementia with Lewy bodies and Alzheimer's disease. And as I think many of you know, um, dementia is a disease of aging. The older we get, the greater our risk of, of acquiring dementia. So it's only some one to two percent of people below the age of 65, and it jumps up to some one, one in three people above the age of 85. So it's really, a, there's no question that age is perhaps the greatest risk uh, for developing dementia. And because the population is aging, as we take care of heart disease, and other problems that used to get us early, uh, dementia is actually becoming a more and more common problem. The number of people living with dementia above the age of 60 was around 3.4 million in North America back in 2001, 5 million in 2010. It's estimated to reach around 9 million uh, in 2040. And of course, that comes with huge social burdens, huge economic burdens, and I think it, uh, it's one of many reasons uh, why, we're, why we all have a real sense of urgency that it's time to, to get a handle on these diseases, find a way to arrest or reverse them, and ideally prevent. So what I plan to do from here on is to get us up to speak with the most common dementia, which is Alzheimer's disease, and then contrast it with the Lewy body diseases, regular Parkinson's disease, um, Parkinson's associated with dementia, and then dementia with Lewy bodies, and then talk about some new tools to understand these illnesses. Any questions up till now? Okay. So this is a picture of a Lois Alzheimer uh, who first described the case of Augusta D, shown on the right, a person uh, with actually a relatively early onset uh, dementia, and he characterized her brain and found the, these features that led to the, the entity we now know as Alzheimer's disease. This was back around 1901. And Alzheimer's disease is the most common neurogenerative disease that I've that touched upon, the most common cause of uh, dementia uh, as well. There's a relatively stereotyped course of, of uh, progression in Alzheimer's disease, although there's a lot of variation. But classically, the, pre the presentation is one of very early forgetfulness that gets worse and worse and worse, particularly for recent conversations and dates, where we put the keys and uh, that sort of thing. And this gets worse, and as it gets worse, we start to develop new problems, such as language impairments, um, coming up with the right word to communicate our thoughts, perhaps. Uh, it can be quite subtle, uh, but nonetheless a, a real change, often associated with visual spatial deficits, getting lost driving, um, for example, difficulty with multitasking, maybe some errors uh, with the bill that's harder to compute, perhaps a, uh, a tip in a restaurant, sort of executive function features. And then with progression of disease, uh, usually a little later, but it can happen earlier too, people will develop apathy, um, and late in the course, even agitation, uh, as well as psychosis, and by that I'm referring to uh, false beliefs, delusions, or uh, seeing things, or hearing things that aren't real, so-called hallucinations. And uh, later with progression, we'll lose not just our ability to handle uh, activities of daily living related to work and oc occupation and social function, but even basic activities of daily living uh, requiring help to to feed ourselves and change and so forth. So this is a, a horrible, relentlessly progressive uh, disease, and this is what Alzheimer's typically looks like clinically. So 
So what does it look like um, anatomically, neuropathologically? Uh, the classic features, and this is where uh, a laser pointer would have been helpful. Um, the classic feature are these plaques that you can see in the brain uh, comprised of beta amyloid, a protein called beta amyloid, and some other proteins too, but amyloid rich plaques outside of brain cells in the brain parenchyma. And then these little protein accumulations inside brain cells, such as these dark spots here called neurofibrillary tangles, comprised of a different protein called tau. Um, so tau and amyloid are sort of the hallmark protein aggregates associated with Alzheimer's disease. And in association with their accumulation, uh, patients will lose brain cells as well. Late in the course of the disease, by no means early, but late in the course of the disease, you can see some shrinkage of the brain as a result of this loss of brain cells. The memory structures of the brain um, are known as the, the hippocampus, um, which they, they actually live deep in, uh, in the brain. This is a, a person standing like this with a slice of bread taken. So we're looking at a coronal cut. And so there's one on each side, and they kind of look like a, a banana on each side, um, so-called uh, hippocampus. This is required for, for memory. We've known that now for many years from uh, a number of important um, clinical cases, but also from patients with Alzheimer's disease. And as you can see in patients with advanced disease, you can see really significant decimation of those memory structures. Um, they're not the only areas that are targeted by uh, neuronal loss. You can see there's shrinkage elsewhere as well, resulting in some say, increased space uh, as well. But the major affliction uh, that, that really is responsible for the, the terrible memory loss uh, is damage to the hippocampus uh, and these related uh, so-called medial temporal structures. Well, let's contrast what I've told you about Alzheimer's disease with the Lewy body dementias. This is Frederick Lewy, um, who in 1912 uh, discovered this accumulation inside brain cells called, which we now call the Lewy body. Um, which is really the hallmark of Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies. Together, the dementia that arises in Parkinson's, Parkinson's dementia, or PDD, um, and dementia with Lewy bodies, or DLB, comprise the second most common dementia. There's, it might be tied with vascular disease, so it's way up there. So this is not an uncommon entity at all. Um, and yet, you don't know too much about it. So we're going we're gonna to change that. Um, so we'll talk about Parkinson's first, uh, which by definition uh, starts with normal cognition. Um, it's the second most common neurodegenerative disease aff afflicting some 1% of the population over the age of 50. And the cardinal signs of Parkinson's disease are motor changes. So um, the statue by uh, Paul Richet from the, the Salpetrier and nicely captures changes in posture that people with Parkinson's can develop. Um, there's often a, a resting tremor, typically starting on one side but, and then spreading to another. Um, often in association with muscular rigidity, giving a cogwheel sort of quality to tremor superimposed with rigidity in the limb. Uh, there's motor slowness, which doctors call bradykinesia. And there's a gait change uh, in association with this change in posture, people's walking will change, they'll shuffle more, take small steps, they might accelerate as they step and as they walk, and turns are often unstable. These are the cardinal signs, and doctors will make a clinical diagnosis of Parkinson's disease uh, on the basis of these signs and the exclusion of some other ones. But there are non-motor signs that are common, very common in Parkinson's as well, including depression, anxiety, even compulsive behaviors, um, and importantly, Cognitive impairment uh, is often present too, particularly as the, as the disease progresses, although some patients never develop it at all. So let's talk about cognitive impairment without dementia in Parkinson's. And by that, by, again, by dementia, I mean that it's trouble thinking that's severe enough to get in the way of our independence of activities of daily living. If it's not getting in the way of that kind of independence, a person is not demented. Okay. Um, and there's, an, there's a nomenclature for all the stuff, but I think practically that's the right, uh, that's an appropriate uh, differentiation for, for our purposes now. 
as Parkinson's progresses, the probability of developing trouble thinking um, goes up from, uh, from about this listed in at least one cognitive domain. So the risk doubles from having just involvement of one limb alone to having involvement of both limbs with postural instability and gait changes. We have a, from 40 to 86 percent. So just progression of the disease itself carries a risk of cognitive impairment. So how common is dementia in Parkinson's? It turns out that there are about 3 to 10 percent uh, of patients with Parkinson's per year who will transition to dementia. And at any one time, about 30 percent of patients with Parkinson's are living with dementia. So this is a, this is a common problem. And in fact, the risk of dementia in people with Parkinson's is about threefold higher uh, than in people without Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's is, is, is itself a risk factor for dementia. We need to understand that so that we can beat it. There are some effectively protective factors that reduce the risk of getting dementia in Parkinson's. One is developing Parkinson's. Some of, many of these we have no control over whatsoever, I should mention. Um, one of these is developing Parkinson's younger. So if we get the disease earlier in our lives, we're less likely to develop dementia. We're more likely to live with the disease for a longer time. And this is a disease, uh, this problem of trouble thinking accumulates risk over time. So if you don't have the disease very long, your, your risk is low as well. So a shorter duration of the disease is also effectively protective. Earlier stage is effectively protective as well. Um, and there are some atypical features that increase the risk. And if you don't have them, that's a good thing. So if you develop early hallucinations, if you develop um, no tremor ever, uh, or have the disease not start on one side, but perhaps start on both sides at the same time, or not even involve both sides, but just involve your, your trunk, those, those are atypical features that increase the risk. So it, in other words, a regular typical course that just starts on one side, as I've described to you, actually comes with a reduced risk of dementia than these atypical courses of Parkinson's disease. When people do develop dementia in Parkinson's, it often looks a little bit different than the dementia we see in Alzheimer's disease. Attention is very frequently impaired, much more than in patients with Alzheimer's for a similar level of impairment, of cognitive impairment, and it often fluctuates quite dramatically from day to day and hour to hour in ways that we don't, that doctors can't always understand. Executive function, planning, multitasking, mental speed, judgment, um, are often significantly impaired disproportionately to memory, whereas in Alzheimer's memory is a thing that you know, comes up and really seems most obviously impaired. Visual spatial function also is often impaired early on. Uh, memory can be impaired, but when it is, it's, it's, uh, and it's not always, but when it is, it's often impaired in a different kind of a pattern than in Alzheimer's. You can think of Alzheimer's disease as perhaps uh, a computer where the hard disk is broken. So you try to write a new memory to disk, but you can't write a disk because the disk isn't working. So when you try to remember what you were exposed to later, it's not going to work. You've never wrote your information to disk in the first place. In Parkinson's disease it's, and dementia with Lewy bodies, it's, it's often the case that the information gets written to disk, and the problem is actually retrieving it. And so if, if, a, if you provide yourself with some cues, if a doctor in the office provides you with some cues to try to remember what you're trying to recall, often that can bring back the memory. So it's an, it's an inefficient retrieval. And in a way, that's good news. The information is there. Um, the hard disk is working. We just have to find a better way to retrieve the information. And I should say language is generally intact as well. So this is a, a different pattern than, than Alzheimer's, and I, I want to emphasize that. In addition, we'll often see behavioral changes in Parkinson's dementia, uh, apathy, so reduced spontaneity, loss of motivation, loss of interest, loss of effortful behavior. Um, patients are just much less likely to uh, get out and do stuff on their own, although they often do what you ask them to do. Um, apathy is very common. Depression or anxiety can develop and worsen um, as well. And it's worth emphasizing that um, a lot of these changes reflect not just the fact that, not, a lot of these mood changes when they occur, uh, reflect not just the fact that 
we're emotionally dealing with a difficult situation, we have a reactive depression or reactive anxiety, but there are actually changes in the brain chemistry that occur because of the disease itself. It alters um, how our mood and how our anxiety works, how our control over anxiety works. Hallucinations can develop um, quite commonly, and these are most often visual hallucinations, usually people, animals, objects, complex hallucinations rather than jagged lines, for example. Um, uh, very common indeed, and as I'll touch upon uh, later, uh, also the rule in, in dementia with Lewy bodies. And delusions can arise as well. They're not uncommonly paranoid delusions, like um, someone's stealing from me and that's why I can't remember, uh, I, I can't find my stuff. Is it because I can't remember where I put it or because someone stole it from me? Well, probably more likely someone stole from me. That's the kind of delusion people can have. A marital infidelity is actually a, a, a common delusion as well. Um, late in the course of any dementia, in, including Parkinson's, DLB, and Alzheimer's, uh, we might not identify our spouse as our spouse, but think of the person who looks like our spouse as an intruder, an imposter. Uh, that's so common it comes with the name Capgras syndrome. Um, so a number of delusions uh, can arise as well. And then excessive daytime sleepiness, too, is very common in this disease, despite sleeping well at night. Now, it's really important to emphasize that many medications can worsen thinking reversibly. They can contribute, they can cause or exacerbate uh, troubled thinking uh, when it arises. And many of the medicines used to treat Parkinson's are actually capable of doing this. And so I, I really want to emphasize that to you guys. Uh, for example, a very popular and effective medicine for tremor in Parkinson's disease known as trihexyphenidyl, the brand name is Artane, um, great for treating tremor, but in an older person, great for causing trouble thinking. Um, so that's a, a medicine to be avoid, you know, avoided, uh, particularly if a person is developing uh, trouble thinking. Um, and so I'll use this in younger people with Parkinson's where they're much less at risk, but I will, I will avoid it in older people with Parkinson's because of the risk and have a low threshold to take it away in people I meet for the first time if they come to see me for trouble thinking. Another Parkinson's medicine, uh, amantadine, uh, also quite effective for Parkinson's, um, can help with fatigue, but at high dose can be quite effective at causing trouble thinking. Um, Tramipexol and Ropinarol, two standard stalwart drugs used to treat Parkinson's disease, are both insufficient dose capable of causing trouble thinking, precipitating hallucinations, driving sleep attacks, compulsive gambling, all sorts of interesting uh, issues. And so doctors and patients should be aware of the risks of, of these agents too. And this is very similar to a medicine called the retigotine patch, um, which recently was, uh, uh, has been on the market for a couple of years now, but recent relative to these other medicines I've mentioned, which carries the same risks. So plenty of medicines in Parkinson's are, are potentially uh, problematic for, for thinking, um, but there are plenty of medicines outside of uh, Parkinson's therapeutics that, that are at risk as well. There are a number of medicines, bladder medicines, um, anti-pain medicines, um, which are called anticholinergics. They block the acetylcholine system. Um, and they can be quite effective if they get into the brain and the nervous system of causing trouble thinking. In fact, they're, they work the same way that arcane works by blocking the acetylcholine system. Um, so amitriptyline is, is a common one. And, uh, you know, urinary frequency is a really big common problem in, in older patients and patients with uh, Parkinson's and patients with dementia. But some of the medicines we use to treat that problem, that gets us up at night to, to urinate, for example, can actually cause trouble thinking. So we've got to choose our medicines carefully. Of course, um, pain medications like opiates um, shouldn't come as a surprise to you. They can cause a fair amount of confusion, too. Uh, that said, we have to treat pain aggressively, and people have to be comfortable, but you've got to go with your eyes open and use the lowest dose you need to treat pain while minimizing confusion. Muscle relaxants like flexoral, also very good at causing confusion. And there are a number of anxiety and sleep aids uh, that can cause that problem well as well. So Benadryl, um, a very effective sleep aid, is great at causing confusion and strongly anticholinergic. Um, it's the active ingredient, ingredient in Tylenol PM, it turns out, and 
these other sleep aids over the counter, so uh, be careful uh, what you use. <laughs> so the question is, what about marijuana? Um, so that, that's a great question. It's uh, ap apropos um, the, the recent uh, state-specific legalization uh, of, of marijuana. There, there's not a lot of data uh, for the benefits or risks of marijuana or its ingredients in DLB, dementia with Lewy bodies, and Alzheimer's disease, and Parkinson's disease. So I'd be very cautious uh, of using these agents. Um, I have had patients whose cognitive impairments I cured by when we backed off on the marijuana. <laughs> so, uh, which, which probably shouldn't come as a surprise to you. I mean, it, it does cause a fair amount of confusion. And patients with dementia with cognitive impairments are much more susceptible to medicines that can cause cognitive impairment. Uh, uh, please. What causes the sleepiness, so much sleepiness all day in LVD? So we don't really understand that. Um, it can be multifactorial, and we'll touch upon it, but of course if you don't get enough sleep the night before, that can certainly contribute to daytime sleepiness. Sleep aids that are there to help us sleep during the night can contribute to daytime sleepiness. Medications that are designed to, for example, treat hallucinations can contribute to daytime sleepiness. But independent of that, there's no question that there are folks with DLB, folks with Parkinson's dementia who do have a lot of daytime sleepiness, and we don't necessarily have a good handle on why. Um, there are a couple of strategies of dealing with that, and I'll, I'll come to some medication strategies in a bit, and we should come back to that for sure if I don't bring it up. Um, but it's not really well understood, long and short. But yeah, tamsulosin is actually, um, it's an alpha-2 receptor antagonist. It doesn't work on the acetylcholine system. Um, medicines like uh, oxybutynin and, uh, anti or anticholinergic, they're meant to work just at the, where the nerve um, innervates the bladder and block that, blocking that connection, which is a, depends upon acetylcholine. But at high enough doses, some of those medicines, like, like oxybutynin, can get into the brain and be anticholinergic. Um, there are approaches to you know, working with patients who have dementia in an emergency room in, a, in, a, in an urgent situation. There are certain approaches that work, certain approaches that don't work. There are certain medicines to absolutely, you know, that can help certain medicines to absolutely avoid in dementia with Lewy body and Parkinson's that in theory might quiet down a person but can actually increase the risk of death. Um, so this is all, all stuff worth talking about. And the other medicine just to mention is before we move on are um, medicines in the class of uh, benzodiazepines. So Ativan, Valium, Clonopin. These are medicines that have been around for a long time that can take the edge off. They have some benefit for short-term anxiety, but they're uh, really not good for thinking. And uh, better, if we can, better to avoid them in patients with dementia. Right, so the, uh, the moral of, of this particular uh, story for this part of the talk then is just if you need these agents, do use them. And you, you know, your doctor can guide those kinds of decisions, but do use them cautiously. There are often safer alternatives um, to avoid cognitive impairments. Neuropathologically, a lot of work has gone into a model um, from a couple of neuropathologists and uh, seminal work by um, someone in Heiko Brock and colleagues uh, that has suggested these Lewy bodies actually ascend into the brain over time in Parkinson's disease. Um, and that perhaps their early ascension corresponds with problems that arise in patients with Parkinson's disease. Um, but ultimately, they get to cortex, uh, such as here, this, this is a Lewy body inside a, a cortical brain cell. Um, and when they do, there's a much higher risk of, of trouble thinking. And I'll come back to this because it contrasts with uh, dementia with Lewy bodies where, as from the get-go, neuropathologically, by definition actually, you have to have cortical Lewy bodies to have dementia with Lewy bodies. So the idea there is that the disease is probably starting actually cortically um, or perhaps diffusely throughout the brain uh, from the beginning. Um, as shown here with these Lewy bodies and some cortical brain cells. The clinical features of dementia with Lewy bodies look a lot like what I've told you about with Parkinson's dementia. Um, we have progressive cognitive decline uh, that involves attention, executive function with reasoning and multitasking, visual spatial skill impairment, plus or minus memory. 
Um, but the difference is that they happen at the beginning. They're not happening well into the course of Parkinson's disease. They happen at the start. Uh, recurrent visual hallucinations are the rule, well-formed, typically of people or animals. Fluctuations in attention and alertness. The sleepiness that came up in the question before, uh, very much, very typical of dementia with Lewy bodies. And then these motor manifestations of what we call Parkinsonism, the, the rigidity, plus or minus the tremor, the walking changes, the postural instability, and the slowing. Um, these are the core features of, clinical features of, of DLB. And they really comprise the clinical criteria that doctors use to make the diagnosis. And we'll, we'll rule out other stuff, but then if people have these features, we'll make the diagnosis. So uh, we recently have a, had an update to the clinical criteria, um, but they require the Parkinsonism, the hallucinations, fluctuations of cognition um, occurring in the context of dementia. The, the fourth thing here on the list is something called REM sleep behavioral disorder, that I'll be telling you about shortly, but Briefly, it's dream reenactment behavior. People will act out their dreams at night. Um, this can actually antedate the illness by decades in some people, both Parkinson's uh, and dementia with Lewy bodies, but it's a major risk factor for the disease and it's often present in the disease. If any two of these four are present in a patient with, with dementia, uh, that leads to a diagnosis of probable dementia with Lewy bodies. Doctors can also make the diagnosis uh, using one of these core features and some other biomarker. So for example, motor features of Parkinsonism are associated with loss of dopamine in the brain. There's a way to measure that using something called a DAT scan. Uh, it's a brain scan that looks at the, do the integrity of the dopamine system. Um, what happened there? <laughs> uh, and if you see uh, low dopamine on your scan, which is a lot like having spontaneous motor features of Parkinsonism accounts towards the diagnosis. Another thing you can do is um, you can get a sleep study that can confirm REM sleep behavioral disorder, the dream reenactment, which is a failure of the normal paralysis of REM sleep. Um, that also can count. And there's another kind of scan, actually a heart scan, that looks at the basically the, the innervation of the heart. And if, if that fails, if the normal innervation of the heart uh, is altered, uh, that can be used in the diagnosis as well. It turns out that these clinical features appear to do a pretty good job uh, letting doctors predict that a person really will have, at, you know, in the brain, under a microscope, evidence of dementia with Lewy bodies. But we don't have a brain scan, we don't have a blood test, um, we don't have a, a, a DNA assessment that can say, yes, this patient absolutely has dementia with Lewy bodies or, or Parkinson's dementia or so forth. I mean, we desperately need those kind of tools, particularly for clinical trials. We, we need to be able to say, you know, everyone in our clinical trial has this disease um, that will, by enriching, will do a much better job of finding <coughs> medicines that help. Now, the clinical features of DLB overlap with Parkinson's dementia, don't they? As I've touched upon, the attention, the executive function, the visual spatial skill, the memory changes, the visual hallucinations, the fluctuations of attention and alertness, the Parkinsonism, these are all seen in both, both illnesses. Um, and neuropathologically, they both have accumulations of Lewy bodies um, comprised of a protein called alpha synuclein. And so in fact, a neuropathologist cannot distinguish whether a person in life has dementia with Lewy bodies or, or Parkinson's um, with or without dementia. And it's given the shared clinical and cognitive and pathological features, um, we really think that DLB, dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson's dementia, exist on a, on a continuum. They're, they're two sides of the same coin, um, two ends of the same spectrum, and it's really our clinical features that, that lead us to call them DLB or Parkinson's dementia. If you have dementia arising in the course of a typical course of, cognitive, of Parkinson's disease, we call it Parkinson's dementia. If the dementia starts early, we call it dementia with Lewy bodies, and by fiat, just by our clinical criteria, we use a, a one-year rule. So if motor impairment precedes trouble thinking by one year, uh, then we'll call it Parkinson's dementia. But it doesn't alter how we treat these illnesses, um, mostly. Um, it doesn't, and it doesn't alter how we think about the neuropathology, and my guess is when treatments come along, they're gonna work for both, for both diseases. 
So some, some important associated clinical features of DLV and, and Parkinson's disease. Um, I've talked to you briefly about REM sleep behavioral disorder. REM sleep is a, when we sleep, there are two components. There's something called slow wave sleep, which we all go into at the beginning of sleep. There's something called REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, uh, where our bodies are paralyzed, but our eyes go back and forth. Rapid eye movement is what REM stands for. And that typically happens late in the night, uh, late in the course of sleep. And that paralysis gets weaker and weaker uh, uh, in Parkinson's and dementia with bodies in association with this thing called REM sleep behavioral disorder. So generally it's the most exciting dreams that can overcome that paralysis. And so people will act out their, their most exciting dreams. They'll wake up punching a wall or kicking their bed partner or falling out of bed. Um, uh, later in the course, even relatively mundane activities can be acted out as well. Another feature, and there are medicines for that uh, when, when needed, but it, it, they're not always required. Another really important feature is this um, concept of severe neuroleptic sensitivity. Neuroleptics are medicines that block dopamine receptors. And patients with Parkinson's, patients, patients with dementia with Lewy bodies lack dopamine. They need every dopamine receptor out there to, to let the dopamine system work as well as it can. Neuroleptics are used to treat uh, agitation, uh, hallucinations, delusions. Um, they're, they're used rather um, uh, excessively by some emergency room doctors and, and the agitated elderly who might come into the, to the ER for one reason or another. And the problem is in, in these diseases, in dementia with Lewy bodies and in Parkinson's dementia, they can really be uh, terrible. They can dramatically worsen Parkinsonism, the motor features. They're also associated with an illness called neuroleptic malignant syndrome that can be quite dangerous. And they're actually associated with an increased risk of death. Um, so this is not true of every neuroleptic, uh, but it's true of many. And so uh, it's worth keeping that in mind and uh, really avoiding such agents in this disease. And then as I touched upon, in both illnesses, given the loss of dopamine cells, it's possible to image uh, dopamine in the brain. And if you do, you'll observe reduced dopamine uh, in the brain of both DLB and Parkinson's dementia. The question um, is, do I find that as dementia with Lewy bodies progresses, the frequency of and um, prevalence of REM sleep behavioral disorder decreases. Um, I, I see a lot of variability. That's one pattern that I've seen in patients I've cared for. I have other patients where it just proceeds unchanged and other, others where it actually uh, 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 exacerbates. So I think it very much depends upon the individual course and probably reflects our lack of understanding of the illness. We should be able to predict who's going to or whom will it get better, or whom will it exacerbate. Sometimes there are medicines we'll use uh, for other reasons um, to treat sleep disorders or, or anxiety. Uh, that turns out the medicines for those purposes can actually benefit the treatment for REM sleep behavioral disorder and diminish its, uh, its severity. So Parkinson's, uh, the question is, um, to some degree, what's the relationship between Parkinson's disease and NMS? So, and, and Parkinson's drugs and NMS. So Parkinson's drugs, broadly speaking, activate the dopamine system. Some of those drugs are used as a, they're a precursor used to make more dopamine in the brain. Um, some of them are dopamine receptor agonists. They act to mimic dopamine in the brain. They don't cause NMS. Uh, NMS uh, arises in the opposite situation where dopamine receptors are blocked too, too aggressively. Um, so it's the opposite. So if you have, if you more dopamine in the brain should protect against NMS actually. And so Parkinson's drugs wouldn't be a risk factor for developing NMS. Instead, medicines that could block dopamine receptors like these neuroleptics that sometimes are, like haloperidol, for example, um, uh, that can be very aggressively used uh, in certain situations of severe agitation in the elderly, that by blocking dopamine receptors can trigger NMS. So what the question is, what's the typical expectancy? And because the variance is so high, I think it's a little bit of a mistake to think of there being typical. Okay. So there's a median. I think the median um, expectancy of life in dementia with blue bodies is something on the order of, of seven years, but there's, there's a lot of variation. Um, and so I just don't know how useful that really is. It's longer in Parkinson's disease, but with huge error bars, if you sort of think of it statistically. The question is, is Lewy body hereditary? Um, broadly speaking, not strongly so in general. There are cases of young onset uh, Lewy body dementia, young onset Parkinson's as well. People will get the disease in their 30s. Um, their parents had it, their grandparents had it, passed down in a, from, you know, in very strongly in the lineage. Um, 
there, with a, that would suggest a single gene being the explanation. And that has been described, it's actually been described when there's a genetic mutation in this protein alpha synuclein, a major component of Lewy bodies. That's rare. It certainly happens, and when it does happen, it gives doctors and scientists a lot of insight into what makes the disease tick and gives us some new tools that we can use to develop treatments. Um, there are other risk factors, genetic risk factors, that carry much sort of smaller modifying risks that do increase some minor uh, percentage risk of developing the disease if your parents had it, but it's, but it's not terribly strong. Given in this individual case, um, it, it seems possible that your family carries a heretical risk factor for dementia with Lewy bodies. There are several that have been identified. Uh, one of them is also a risk factor for Parkinson's disease. It's known as uh, the GBA gene. And this gets at one of the questions that was asked of me ahead of time. Um, GBA is uh, actually a very common mutation, um, uh, particularly among, among Ashkenazi Jews, it turns out. Um, but it's seen elsewhere as well. And it increases the risk of getting Parkinson's. It increases the risk of getting dementia with Lewy bodies. And when you get Parkinson's, it, it's associated with an increased risk of trouble thinking in Parkinson's as well. Um, we didn't know about its risk of par in Parkinson's at all until in DLV until relatively recently. Um, we've known for a long time that when this when this gene is is absent or uh, mutated both on both chromosomes that we carry, we get a disease called Gaucher's, which is a, a horrible disease that arises in, in childhood. Um, but it turns out now we know that even one just carrying one mutation, no no Gaucher's, does confer this risk. That's the basis for a lot of research and actually for some recent clinical trials using medications in people carrying a GBA gene who might not even have symptoms yet to, um, or might be very minimally symptomatic with Parkinson's to see if we can arrest the disease or, or reverse it. Um, so those kinds of insights are mostly useful for that purpose for, for developing new clinical trial tools. Um, and there are people called genetics counselors whose whole job it is to guide families in thinking about whether to have a genetic test or not. Um, there are circumstances where I think it makes some sense, but there are many circumstances where I think it doesn't. Um, so, for example, if, if I know that, if, that carrying a gene increases my risk of getting disease X from, let's say, 1% to 10%, um, that doesn't mean I'll get the disease, it just means it increases my risk. Knowing that it's going to increase my, you know, my risk of anxiety, my risk of depression, my family's risk of anxiety and depression because if I carry the gene, well, my siblings might as well. And the people who stand to benefit the most from knowing what, what, I, what I carry genetically is an insurance company because they can say, this guy's a high risk. Why would I want to cover him? And yet we have no cure, no treatment to provide the people who carry that, just that genetic mutation. Um, Two questions. Let's answer the first. The second question is: um, Do they do Parkinson's dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies show up differently in autopsy? And broadly speaking, the answer is no. Um, by definition, Lewy bodies are required to be present in cortex to make the diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies. People with Parkinson's dementia might have Lewy bodies uh, in cortex. They might have Lewy bodies in an area called anterior cingulate cortex, without being all over floridly the rest of cortex, but. I don't think that's enough to, to really designate a difference. There might be an increase, there is an increased risk of having um, Alzheimer copathologies, amyloid and tau, in dementia with Lewy bodies compared to Parkinson's dementia, but these changes are often seen in both disorders and can be seen, it can, can, can be absent in, in either. Um, and in turn to your first question is, are Parkinson's dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies treated differently during life? Um, yes, they, they generally are. People with Parkinson's disease might trek along for a long time before they develop trouble thinking. And in that context, they'll see movement disorder specialists who will fine tune their medicines, um, their motor medicines, sometimes aggressively to help them to really move. So they can acquire more of a, a regimen to treat the motor problems of Parkinson's before they develop trouble thinking. Um, and then when they do develop trouble thinking, sometimes those medicines have to be peeled back because they can exacerbate it uh, while we add on smart drugs to help people to think better and, and so forth. In Dementia with Lewy Bodies, we're emphasizing the smart drugs up front, we're, and we're cautious uh, with the motor drugs not to exacerbate trouble thinking that's already present. So, so really, it's, the differences are based primarily on the timing, um, and also by the specialists who see the patients. So 
patients with Parkinson's disease, dementia, are classically being followed in a movement disorder specialty clinic, and their expertise is in the movement meds. Patients with dementia with Lewy bodies, some of the time it's the movement clinic, some of the time it's a memory clinic, and of course some of the time it's not a neurologist at all, it's a primary doc and not a community for both of these illnesses. Um, but that variability can result in, in, uh, in sort of social variability results in differences in treatment. The, the question is, are there are there treatments available in Alzheimer's disease besides medications? Is that right? Yes. The, the options in Alzheimer's disease are, are medications and non-medical interventions such as social engagement, exercise, home health aids, you know, redir redirection when patients are anxious. Uh, but we don't have, for example, a surgical solution. Uh, that's what you mean. It's, you know, there are medicines and, and there are, are non-medication strategies. The risks and benefits of, of, of every decision we make, including hospitalization. So at Massachusetts General Hospital, we have a dedicated set of what we call neurology, a set of what are called delirium precautions that we'll use. We'll make sure that people are up during the day. We'll open the windows and open the, the shades, expose people to lights. We'll try to get them to sleep at night and, and not have sleep-wake reversal. We'll try not to disturb them at night. There's, there's a lot of things we can do. Uh, and of course, to avoid certain medications that can precipitate confusion. These are big issues and, a, and certainly a major topic of conversation. And it, there's a lot of variability in, across emergency room staff. Um, some physicians know and are really up on it, and some really don't. Um, the word is getting out. Uh, increasingly, patients, uh, uh, staff will know, and, and patients will even know to tell the staff. So I, I'll t I tell my patients that you've got a Haldol allergy, effectively a Haldol allergy. Uh, don't let haloperidol allergy, don't let anyone give it to you. Um, but ER docs should be, I think, uh, there should be better training to create some uniformity and expertise across emergency room doctors to be sensitive to Parkinsonism um, as a, because of some those motor changes that help the doctor to, to avoid medicines like that. The fluctuations in dementia with Lewy bodies um, are actually rather hard to study. Um, we don't have really strict uh, objective criteria, but uh, the Mayo Clinic's come up with some nice features that we, we can use or can show to be clinically useful to uh, for identifying fluctuations in the, the, there are sort of four cardinal features. Um, let's see if I can remember them. But uh, patients who, despite sleeping well at night, are drowsy during the day, sort of reliably drowsy during the day, episodically so perhaps, um, sleeping for two hours during the day, despite sleeping well at night. Those are the, the two arousal related features. And then scaring off into space episodically, mm -hmm. uh, where you can't really quite get them back. And other times they're really quite fine. Um, and then the last one is episodically just not making a lot of sense, being kind of tangential and out of it, and other times being quite clear. And that can happen on a time course of hours or days, uh, but not, I don't think that it's happening once every five to six months. Mm -hmm. That sounds different. Yeah. Um, and we don't know what makes that tick. We don't understand what the neurobiology of fluctuations are. We don't have good medicines for them. Certainly things can, uh, medications and infections, talk what we call the doctors will call toxic metabolic situations like a urinary tract infection or a cough or a cold can trigger uh, 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 trouble thinking. I don't think of that as the fluctuations of DLB. Um, in a patient who has trouble thinking or in a patient who has a uh, of a troubled brain, a brain that's perhaps people working, work, doing all right, but they've had maybe meningitis in the past or something like that, they might be more prone to having trouble thinking in, uh, in the context of these kinds of toxic metabolic exposures. Your father has, um, uh, is, has Parkinson's, maybe now uh, Lewy body disease, yes. Lewy body dementia, uh, and he has fluctuations of motor function where he'll be able to do something just fine at one point and later on not be able to do so. Um, that's very common in Parkinson's all by itself without any associated cognitive impairment. It happens in Parkinson's dementia, it happens in dementia with Lewy bodies as well. Um, as, as we lose our dopamine cells, that's a, a relentlessly progressive process and we become um, more sensitive to the loss of dopamine cells uh, and more dependent upon medications that replete dopamine in the brain. Uh, we can experience what are called on-off phenomena, where we, I don't know if your father's on a medication, but like that carbidopa, levodopa, for example, but it wouldn't be uncommon for a medicine to work and then it comes to the end of the dose, it's wearing off, and you're able to move one moment, and now you can't. Yes, um, trying to reassure the patient. It turns out that patients who can be extremely uh, Parkinsonian have a terrible time moving, 
uh, can still be just about the first person out of a burning house. So the question is, are there medicines in Parkinson's that can help with movement that don't carry uh, some risk of hallucinations? And every medicine is different. I'd say that the safest one really is carbidopa and levodopa, um, but every medicine is different. So the question is, um, how, how does one proceed with a procedure like cataract surgery when you have a dimension like Alzheimer's, dementia fluid bodies, or perhaps both? Um, I like the idea of, of minimizing the anesthesia required, but um, you know, having more vision might actually help. Um, it might help this function significantly. Um, vision seems to you know, really help engage, engage us, provide us a sense of context, and you might actually see some bounce back from that procedure. Um, but yeah, the, the, broadly speaking, the anesthesiologist, I'm sure, will choose agents that are you know, the shortest acting possible agents. They'll choose the lowest dose that does the job. You want something that works and that wears off quickly. I can stop anytime. I have plenty more slides. <laughs> you know, we try to take away all the medicines that exacerbate fluctuations, all the medicines that exacerbate trouble thinking, um, and all the smart drugs we can uh, to help. Uh, that does mean a couple of issues that I think are worth touching upon. Um, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. One quick mention about REM sleep behavioral disorder. I've told you about it already, but I should mention that. It's a predictor not just for Parkinson's dementia with Lewy body, but another sister disease called multiple systems atrophy. So a person with acting out one's dream at night uh, is at risk for any of those three, or uh, turning on its head, if you have any of those three, you might subsequently develop uh, REM sleep behavioral disorder. Um, we've touched upon neuroleptic sensitivity. Um, just to mention that, I told you about uh, Neuroleptics, also known as antipsychotics. There are typical antipsychotics which are kind of old school and largely not, no longer in favor. There are atypical antipsychotics which are relatively more recent, although they've been around for a while now, like Risperidone and uh, 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 Zyprexa. Um, these agents can cause uh, trouble as well. Nonetheless, there are patients who need medicines to help with severe hallucinations and agitation and upset. And when you need something, um, my first choice actually is, uh, when it's not sort of an acute situation, is to use an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor like donepazil. We'll talk about those kind of agents, that, things that actually increase the acetylcholine system, the opposite of an anticholinergic. When those don't work, medicines in the same family that are much safer for this purpose are quetiapine or clozarol, uh, a quetiapine or seroquel and clozapine or clozarol. And there's a more recent agent called pimavancerin or new placid that's been uh, if FDA approved for Parkinson's dementia associated psychosis, hallucinations, or delusions. There's, it's not yet studied in dementia with Lewy bodies. It's hard to do clinical studies in dementia with Lewy bodies to get funding for that purpose. Um, my guess is it'll work there too. Um, so quetiapine, clozapine, and probably pimavanserin are, are reasonable for, for treating psychosis, hallucinations, and delusion in these illnesses. Um, distinguishing the Lewy body dementia from Alzheimer's disease, um, well, hallucinations are early in DLB and PD dementia, and they can occur late in the course of Alzheimer's. Parkinson's can occur early in DLB and PD. Uh, they can occur late in the course of Alzheimer's. <coughs> Fluctuations of arousal and attention are much more uh, dominant in DLB and Parkinson's dementia. Memory loss can occur in both, but it's more common and an early pervasive problem in Alzheimer's. Uh, Early problems with attention, executive function, visual, spatial skill will direct doctors towards thinking more about diseases other than Alzheimer's. Certainly DLB and Parkinson's dementia have more of that than Alzheimer's early. And the REM sleep behavioral disorder doesn't arise in Alzheimer's. And that can be useful. And then in terms of MRI scans, again, looking at a coronal cut, this, this uh, sandwich view, you can see in, in DLB and Parkinson's dementia, there's really nice preservation of the memory structures. Uh, compared to Alzheimer's disease, there's not as much general shrinkage of the brain as there, in a, as there is in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and again, that should be good news. It, it means there are neurons already there to save um, if we can find a way to do that. Um, I told you earlier that uh, Alzheimer's changes are common in these diseases. Uh, so amyloid plaques, uh, tau aggregates are quite common. In fact, some 85% of cases of dementia with Lewy bodies will have some, some amyloid, this is the, the key protein of Alzheimer's disease, as is tau, uh, but they're variably present, and, and uh, we've been doing a lot of research, and we're one of several groups doing so, to try to understand their contribution, but when they're present, they do appear to be associated with trouble, uh, with thinking. Other contributions to trouble thinking, 
at probably the Lewy bodies play a role, the alpha sleeping aggregates, the dopamine cells that are lost project to motor areas, but some dopamine cells project to thinking areas and emotional areas, and their loss could, of course, complicate stuff. Um, I don't think we need to dwell on this, but it's possible to, to image beta amyloid using scans. In our own work, we found that patients with dementia with Lewy bodies often have elevated amyloid in the brain, like in Alzheimer's disease, um, compared to most healthy, cognitively normal older people. And in Parkinson's dementia, it's usually somewhere in between. There might be a little bit, uh, usually not a lot. Uh, I know that's what's there. I don't think we need to talk about it, but all but it shows is that the presence of amyloid is associated with a faster decline, a greater risk of decline of thinking compared to folks who, who don't have any amyloid in Parkinson's. How, in the, the best of those are amyloid scans that are now available, available and FDA approved over the last uh, several years. Um, but they're not, they're not paid for by insurance companies as yet, but they're, they're useful tools. Tau PET scans have come along that let us look at tau in the brain, those other Alzheimer proteins. Um, my colleagues have shown the accumulation of tau is associated with trouble thinking, and the healthy elderly was spread to the much of the brain um, in progression to Alzheimer's disease. And we've been interested in exploring how, compared to normal people, uh, we've been exploring, among others, uh, how tau might relate to trouble thinking and DLB and, and Parkinson's as well. And many patients, uh, but by no means all, with DLB and Parkinson's dementia have some elevated tau as well. And we think that relates to, to thinking as well. So there's more than one thing going on that's causing trouble with thinking. Uh, and then uh, how about alpha synuclein, the main component of Lewy bodies? Uh, here, that's what's shown in, in yellow brown using an antibody. There have been a number of studies over the years to try to figure out what the contribution of uh, alpha synuclein and Lewy bodies is to thinking. Um, one study suggested that it's really important for the connection between brain cells that happens at these tiny little excre excrescences uh, called the dendritic spines where neurons connect to one another and that, there, that those are lost uh, in patients with dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, one of the questions here asks, you know, what's alpha synuclein doing? Um, and what's going on in dementia with Lewy bodies, and that gets to that question. And the, this picture also gets at that question. And these guys, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Rob Edwards and colleagues, took, a, took brain cells that were overexpressing too much of the bad alpha synuclein and showed that it, it reduced the conversation between cells, what's called synaptic transmission. And it also altered what the, what the synapse looks like, what that point of communication looks like. So, it appears to play an important role uh, there as well. But there are other things that go wrong in, in these diseases as well that are also important to consider and yet another target for trying to improve thinking. Um, and that's this molecule acetylcholine. Um, there's an area of the brain called the ventral forebrain. These little dark cell, uh, spots are cells. And in normal people, the system looks like that. In the healthy elderly, in Parkinson's dementia, you get a decimation of those brain cells. And that's really the basis for clinical trials that increase acetylcholine in the brain. Um, we can look at that with imaging, uh, but in, in a, for example, in this, in this important study from 2004, placebo-controlled in the New England Journal of Medicine, the addition of a medication that increases brain levels of acetylcholine um, was associated with a, with a long-standing improvement in thinking compared to controls. Um, and for some patients, that, and we have similar data in dementia with Lewy bodies, for some patients the benefit is significant. Um, for some patients the benefit is, is much more minor, uh, but it's a safe medicine, it's one of medicine, many in the same class that increases instead of cooling in the brain. And I, I think it's always worthwhile to, to take advantage of medicines that can help. Um, you can look at dopamine in the brain really back to thinking as well, but I think another source of importance. So several therapies are currently available but, and we'll touch upon them, but no treatments exist yet to arrest or reverse uh, these diseases. And there's a lot of research going on to try to, to, try to beat them. Um, I touched upon the rhinostigmine study uh, to increase acetylcholine. Denepazil, also known as uh, brand name Aricept, galantamine, brand name Razodine, or other medicines that can increase acetylcholine in the brain. Um, Higher doses may help because the key is to get the medicines to increase acetylcholine in the brain, not just in the, in the bloodstream uh, or in the gut where the medicine is, is digested. 
Um, another medicine, the Menda, Memantine, developed for Alzheimer's disease, has been studied and shown to be effective in Parkinson's dementia, variably so in dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, in my own experience, I think the benefit in some of the studies as well is, is rather small on average, but there are true responders. It's a minority of, you know, with a robust response. And it's another safe medicine worth trying um, as well. There's good evidence that physical exercise can really help Parkinsonism, it can really help the mood. Um, and, and in that context, getting people outdoors and so forth, it's, it's not unreasonable for the to perhaps play a role in cognition as well, although that's much more controversial. And um, exercise, how, how will it do all those things? Well, it's presumably in part translating into important factors in the brain, like growth factors. It's not well understood, but there, there really is a true benefit of physical exercise in Parkinson's disease, and I wouldn't be surprised if there was a, a true benefit in dementia with Lewy bodies as, as well. Um, if we could find out what that was, we could you know, provide more of it. But in the meanwhile, exercise is good for all of us, it's good for the heart, good for the brain. Um, cognitive exercise is much more um, uh, of a debate. There's no good studies that have definitively shown that cognitive exercises uh, help, but staying cognitively active does help. And the data are really good that people who are more socially active and cognitively active are at an advantage. So I think you know, doing the things you like to do, whatever it is, um, uh, something, something that taxes us a little bit it is definitely useful. Um, whatever it might be, Scrabble, Sudoku, uh, bridge with friends, that kind of thing. Even conversations where you have to follow what people are saying, stay engaged, uh, you have to work out. That's a, that's a mental exercise and it's worth, uh, it's worth the exercise. I'll just briefly contrast the studies that show acetylcholine esterase inhibitors, the acetylcholine studies in Alzheimer's compared to Parkinson's dementia. In Parkinson's dementia, as I showed you, there's an improvement in thinking compared to six months of these are people who are untreated, people treat a placebo versus drug. Here's Alzheimer's, placebo drug. So you s relatively stay steady with, with Alzheimer's compared to this decline, as opposed to actually getting uh, on average a benefit compared to, uh, to the placebo. So I, I think it, to me this emphasizes the value of using this kind of a medication. Um, for hallucinations and delusions, we touched upon this, but these acetylcholine esterase inhibitors can be quite effective, and that's the place I try to start. Um, these medicines can do the job. Um, that said, uh, these atypical antipsychotics I talked to you about already, quetiapine, clozarol, maybe new classes, uh, have a role too. Um, we just got to go in carefully and keep in mind the risk factors and, and watch, for, watch for worsening of Parkinsonism. Um, so broadly speaking, doctors have to work hard to eliminate other contributions to trouble thinking, to behavioral problems to consider medication side effects and their interactions, consider other medical problems as well that can play a role, and really aggressively manage depression anxiety. Um, if I'm busy ruminating because I'm down, I'm not listening to what someone's telling me, and then I get down on myself for not having remembered what someone was trying to tell me, and you have this sort of vicious, vicious uh, spiral. Uh, so it's really important to treat depression and anxiety well, and these can exacerbate not just trouble thinking, but trouble moving as well. Um, you might know that anxiety, for example, can dramatically bring out tremor in patients with Parkinson's disease, um, make, make people feel much worse. It's another reason to exercise. Um, so we do need new tools uh, to help. Uh, many are in development to predict who will get a dementia, to di diagnose patients with specific dementias, uh, and of course to prevent dementia, to cure dementia. We're not there yet, um, but there are some good ideas out there. There are clinical trials going on with amyloid clearance therapies. Um, several drugs have failed. Um, perhaps the most exciting um, study to date uh, is uh, still pending, something called the, the aducanumab trial to clear amyloid from the brain and people who have elevated amyloid demonstrated with an amyloid scan. So it's a clever trial uh, designed for people with early Alzheimer's or pre-Alzheimer's. Uh, we'll see if that works, but if it does, those kinds of treatments become completely applicable to patients with DLV and Parkinson's dementia who happen to have elevated amyloid. Some do, some don't. Um, so these kind of treatments will become available. The same is true of tau uh, therapies as well. Um, so let's see, two conclusions. Um, conclusion one, uh, Alzheimer's and the Lewy body dementias are clinically distinct as we've sort of gone, gone over in some detail. The early memory loss followed by involvement of other domains of thinking is characteristic of, of Alzheimer's, where in DLB, Exec and, and Parkinson's dementia, executive function, attention, and visual spatial skill 
more commonly so, although memory might be involved too. We have the hallucinations present in both. Uh, delusions or apathy may arise. The prominent fluctuations of attention, the concomitant motor changes of Parkinsonism, and the REM sleep behavioral disorders. These really are you know, clinically quite distinct entities. Um, conclusion two, uh, Alzheimer's and the Lewy body dementias do respond to similar medications. There's evidence in both diseases for benefit for these acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. That said, these medicines look to be at least as effective in the Lewy body dementias as they are in Alzheimer's, and, and so I think it's worthwhile uh, using them. And then treating hallucinations and delusions must be done carefully, uh, be given this risk of avoiding, uh, uh, risk to make Parkinson's worse. We don't, one doesn't have to always treat hallucinations. You know, if, I'm, if, my, if I'm seeing my grandmother sitting on the couch in the afternoons, that can be a pleasure, and it's not necessarily one needs to, something one needs to treat. Uh, on the other hand, if, I'm, if my hallucination is scary and affecting my quality of life, that, that's another story. Uh, often hallucinations will respond just to redirection, getting people out of the context in which they came along. Um, and I, they need not be uh, a problem with it. They're not by in and of themselves dangerous. But if we do need to treat them, there are medicines uh, to do so. Uh, lastly, we've got a bunch of tools on the horizon uh, that are making their way, to, certainly to clinical trials. Uh, in the brain scan approaches soon, I hope one day we might have a, an, uh, an alpha synuclein Lewy body PET scan or blood test or spinal fluid test. Um, that's what CSF stands for, cerebral spinal fluid. Um, these will hopefully come along to really help us with the diagnosis, help us figure out which medicines to give to, to which patients, and ultimately to guide preventive therapies. Um, as I've mentioned, if amyloid clearance approaches or tau clearance approaches now in clinical trials work for Alzheimer's, they could be valuable for a select subset of patients with DLB and Parkinson's dementia as well. And then people are starting to think hard about targeting alpha synuclein, targeting the Lewy body uh, carefully in clinical trials using antibodies and small molecules too. Uh, and we'll see what comes of those. But I think these are exciting times. We are going to beat these diseases, we're just, but we're certainly not there yet. Right, so um, it probably uh, goes off saying that one should stay physically, cognitively, socially active. I, I really think there's true value in each of those. Um, avoid the to toxic agents we touched upon today, including medications. Um, and doctors really have to work with patients and families to identify and treat reversible contributions of trouble thinking. Um, these include thyroid disorders, B12 deficiency, some salt imbalance problems, low calcium, high calcium, sleep disorders, depression, anxiety, uh, uh, to really give people every chance to think as well as they possibly can. I think there are a lot of clever hypotheses out there um, that don't have a lot of um, clinical trials to back them up. Um, I tend to err on the side of skepticism with such ideas. And I'd love to see a, a careful clinical trial that shows that these good ideas work, and then I would advocate that. Well, I just want to thank you all for uh, for staying, and I've, it's been a pleasure to speak with you today. I'm, I'm available, um, certainly now, to answer any further questions you might have. Um, our Louis Body Unit is um, really interested in serving the community, and so if you do have uh, loved ones or family members or, or friends who are suffering from this disease who, who need additional input, please do reach out to, to me and to us, and I can provide you our information. Thanks again for the, the wonderful invitation. It was just terrific to speak to uh, everybody today. Um, I, I think that it's really important that we have some explicit outreach um, from, from our community of uh, experts at Mass General and, and the Brigham and, and the greater um, Harvard community uh, out to the North Shore and, and to, uh, to Massachusetts in general. Um, and I'm delighted to, to, to come today, delighted to return next year as well. Um, and uh, I think we make outreach and really are making outreach an explicit effort uh, as we try to build up the uh, the, uh, the care and the resources available to people through the Lily Body Dementia Unit that we've uh, set up. Thank you. Thank you.